So what actually is LIPS? LIPS is short for Laser Induced Breakdown Spectroscopy. It falls under the category of Atomic Emission Spectroscopy. And to explain what Atomic Emission Spectroscopy is, we first have to talk about what Atomic Emission is. When we heat a material, the atoms inside the material absorb the energy. If we heat the material enough, we are able to excite the electrons of the atoms the material is made of. That means that they undergo a transition from a low energy level to a higher energy level, just like in this picture. But in this state, the electrons are unstable. So as soon as they get the possibility, they will fall back to their ground energy state. By doing that, they emit the energy they absorbed earlier. They do that in the form of a photon. Depending on how big the transition is, the electrons will emit light of a different wavelength. If an electron falls from a higher state of energy, it will emit a shorter wavelength than if it falls from a lower state of energy. These transitions from different energy levels are unique for each element. That means that we can identify the element by looking at the wavelength it emits. And this is the spectroscopy part. In the spectrometer, the different wavelengths are split up and will hit the sensor at different locations. By comparing the recorded spectrum with a database or with a reference sample, we are able to identify the unknown sample. You probably have seen this effect before without knowing its application. Whenever you see fireworks in the sky, you are seeing the effects of atomic emission. In these fireworks, different salts are used to change the color of the flame. You can try this yourself by holding some sodium chloride in the flame of a burner and you will see a bright yellow-orange light. What you are seeing is the dominant spectral line of sodium at 589 nanometers. If you look at street lamps, at least the ones that haven't been replaced by LED, you can see this distinct yellow line of sodium. In these lights, sodium vapor lamps are used. In these lamps, sodium atoms are excited and they emit light. It's the same principle that is used in fluorescent light bulbs. In these lamps, a small amount of mercury is excited by an electrical discharge until it emits light. Because the mercury spectrum is mainly in the ultraviolet range, the light cannot be seen by the naked eye. A phosphor, and don't mistake this for the element phosphor, a phosphor coating on the inside of the lamp is used to convert this ultraviolet light into visible light. The phosphor layer can be made out of different materials. What they have in common is that they emit light when exposed to some kind of radiant energy. Most of the lamps use terbium, cerium or lanthanum for the green and blue emissions and europium for the red emission. In the case of LIPS, we use a laser to vaporize a small amount of the sample from the surface and the laser also heats the vaporized material to the point of becoming a plasma. And when this plasma cools down and the atoms and electrons recombine, they emit light uh, the same way I explained before. We then use a fiber optic cable to guide the light into the spectrometer. Inside the spectrometer, the light gets split up into its consisting wavelength and we will get a spectrum in our software. It is crucial to time the recording of the spectrum precisely. The laser pulse is about 10 nanoseconds long. After that, the plasma takes around one to several microseconds to decay, depending on the laser energy deposited. Directly after the laser hits the surface, we will only get a continuous spectrum. You can see the continuous spectrum on the upper graph. This continuous spectrum contains very little spectroscopic information. And after a little bit of time passes and the plasma decays, we will get the discrete lines you can see on the lower spectrum. To take the spectrum at the correct time, I'm using a photodiode. It is a photodiode that is sensitive to infrared light and it is mounted inside of the housing of the spectrometer itself. To direct the infrared light produced by the laser to the photodiode, I'm using a second fiber optic cable. It is a cheap Toslink cable and this cable is mounted near the sample, but a little bit further away than the fiber optic cable I'm using for the spectrometer itself. Let's talk about the software I'm using with the spectrometer. In the beginning, I was using a software made by Jens Fröhlich. You can see it here right now. I will link Jens Fröhlich's homepage in the description. 
His software is an upgrade to Aspen Russell software. Aspen Russell software can be found on his WordPress page. It's the same page I got the PCB for the linear CCD sensor from. Jens Fröhlich software has a few functions built into it that Aspen Russell software is missing. You are, for example, able to calibrate your spectrometer. But there were two problems with his software, or at least his software was not suitable for my purpose. The first problem was that there is no possibility to use the signal of the photodiode as a trigger. Like I explained earlier, we want the spectrum to be taken after the laser hit the surface of the sample. The second problem was that his calibration only uses two points. To calibrate the spectrometer properly, you need more than that. So the reason for that is that the calibration curve is not linear. That's not a huge problem if you're using the spectrometer and the software to measure the absorbance, because in this case you are only interested in the change of intensity at a certain wavelength over time. But if you plan to identify the composition of a sample by the light it emits, it's crucial to know the exact wavelength of every peak. To illustrate what I'm talking about, I have plotted the pixel number against the true wavelength in origin. And as you can see, if I use a strictly linear calibration curve, the points in the middle are not on this curve, so they won't be correct. But there is a way around this. If you use a third order polynomial fit to fit this curve, you can use these coefficients to calibrate your spectrometer accordingly. There's a great PDF document by Ocean Optics where this process is explained in detail. You basically use this equation to calculate the wavelength at a certain pixel number. Despite my exceptional programming skills, I was not able to get the software to work the way I wanted to, so I guess I must have forgotten a semicolon somewhere in the code. So I was very fortunate to meet somebody online who was willing to spend many hours of his time to create a software that was suitable for my purpose. And without his help, this project would certainly not have been possible. So thank you a lot. I will put the link to his website in the description. And if the software by the time this video releases is on his GitHub page, I will also link his GitHub page in the description. This is his software. And the software has two functions that I really like. The first function I want to talk about is the calibration. To calibrate your spectrometer, you need a light source with known wavelength. You can use a calibration light source made for this purpose. These light sources often use a argon mercury lamp and you can use the lines of these gases to calibrate your spectrometer. In my case, I'm using a fluorescent light bulb and use the mercury peaks and also the peaks of the phosphor layer to calibrate the spectrometer. In addition to the fluorescent light bulb, I'm also using a 405 and 532 nanometer laser to get two extra points to calibrate the spectrometer. What you see on the screen right now is the spectrum of a fluorescent light bulb. You can use Google to look up a reference spectrum and search for the wavelength that correlate to these peaks. For example, the first peak is a mercury peak at 405 nanometers approximately. So what you do is you go to polyfit, click add, and you will see a new window appears. And you can now use the sensor pixel number and the wavelength to calibrate your spectrometer for these peaks. So we zoom into the first peak. And by alt right click, we can add the pixel number to this window. And we type in the reference wavelength. It's 404.656 nanometers. And we will do this for every peak. As I said, after this, I'm using two lasers to calibrate the spectrometer further. Right now, you're seeing the peak of a 532 nanometer laser. So we will also add this peak to the calibration. We will do the same thing for a 405 nanometer laser. After we did this, we can just click Add Polynomial and we will get the new coefficients here and the calibration is done. Another great feature of the software is the possibility to compare your spectrum to a reference spectrum taken from the NIST database. You can find the NIST database in the link I will put in the description. 
and the software automatically loads the spectra and you can search for the element symbol you want to compare to your spectrum, click on it and it creates an overlay on top of your spectrum. This is the spectrometer I'm using in combination with the laser. It's in a 3D printed case that houses the spectrometer and all its peripherals. In the left hand corner here, you can see the main spectrometer. It's the housing and the optics of a B&V Tech spectrometer. In here are the collimating mirror, the focusing mirror and the diffraction grating. It's a grating with 1800 lines per millimeter and the slits width is um, 100 micrometers. If you buy them like this, they come without any electronics and without the sensor. So you have to fit the sensor yourself, but they're way cheaper this way. If you buy them with electronics, they can, it depends if they're ready to go. They're around 700 bucks to 1,500 bucks, depending on the model. There are different versions where they are just, I think, salvaged parts from other spectrometers with the electronics. You can get them for around 200 bucks. This one was 90 bucks, but as I said, you have to fit them with a sensor yourself. The sensor I'm using is a Toshiba TCD 1304, one just like these. The alignment can be pretty challenging because you have to get them in a position where the light from the diffraction grating hits right on the pixels of the linear CCD. The CCD is connected to this PCB. It's a PCB made by Espen Russell. You can find it on his WordPress page. I will link it in the description down below. And the main board here is the Nucleo F401RE board. You can see that there's another thing connected to this Nucleo board. It's a photodiode in this corner. The photodiode is used to trigger the spectrometer to capture a spectrum. There are two fiber optic cables going into the spectrometer. One is this Toslink cable. It is used to capture the infrared light produced by the laser. And as soon as the infrared light hits the photodiode, it triggers the spectrometer to take a spectrum. The other one is a SMA905 cable. It is a cable designed for spectrometers and it captures the light that enters the spectrometer. This is what the spectrometer looks like when taken apart. You can see the fiber optic cable coming from the side here. So the light enters through here. Right where the fiber optic cable is connected, there is a slit. The slit has a width of 100 micrometers. So the light enters through here, hits this collimating mirror. After the collimating mirror, it hits the diffraction grating. And from the diffraction grating, it goes to the focusing mirror. And the focusing mirror focuses the different wavelength onto the CCD sensor that is located right here. You have to be very careful with these optics. Do not attempt to clean the diffraction grating. You can clean them. You will damage them if you try to. Even if you're extremely careful using a microfiber cloth, it won't work. This is what it looks like with the CCD sensor fitted. So the CCD sensor is mounted to a 3D printed part. And this part is just hold on to the spectrometer by friction. But once the spectrometer is mounted in its main case, there are two brackets that hold on this 3D printed part and it won't move. It's held on tightly to the spectrometer. But when it's not mounted in the case, you can just separate the two of them. So right now the fiber optic cable of the spectrometer is pointed at a fluorescent light bulb. And I put a piece of paper at the position where normally the sensor would be. And if you watch closely, you can make out the spectrum of a fluorescent light bulb. For example, the first two blue lines here, I think they're mercury lines at 405 and 436 nanometers. And also the green line you can see here is a mercury line at 500 and 46 nanometers, I think. The red line, I'm not quite sure. I think it's a, a europium line at 611 nanometers. I replaced the piece of paper with the actual CCD sensor. And just like with the piece of paper, you can see that the sensor is illuminated at different locations. 
at which locations depends on the light that enters the spectrometer through this fiber optic cable. The reason for that is that light of different wavelengths gets bent at a different angle at this diffraction grating. And this is the way we actually get our spectrum, because certain pixels on this sensor are illuminated while others are not. And by calibrating the spectrometer, we basically tell the software that, for example, pixel number 300 corresponds to 300 nanometers. And if pixel number 300 is illuminated and the others are not, the others are dark, we will get a peak at 300 nanometers. Let's take a second to talk about safety. Whenever you're using a laser that is powerful enough to damage your eyesight permanently, make sure to squint as hard as you can. Make sure to use appropriate safety glasses. There are different safety glasses. They're rated for a certain wavelength and for a certain power level. You can get cheap ones from Amazon or eBay, but I would not recommend buying these because you don't know what you're getting. Even if they say they're certified, you can't be sure. They can get pretty expensive. These ones were, I think, 230 bucks, but it's a small amount of money compared to what you're getting. Because just think about what you would pay to get back your eyesight after you damaged it. Take a fraction of that amount, spend it beforehand, and you're good. Here you can see the complete setup. On the right hand side, you can see the Q switched ND Yuck laser. It is the laser out of a tattoo removal machine from China. I removed the laser from this handpiece. I think Styropyro made a video about these lasers a while ago, and I think he had the same model I have. If you want to know anything about lasers, just go to his channel. He knows more about lasers than I probably ever will. Here you can see the fiber optic cable that goes to the spectrometer and carries the light that is analyzed. And the second fiber optic cable in the back that is mounted here is used to trigger the spectrometer. To analyze smaller samples, I 3D printed the sample holders. But right now, let's test something bigger. It is a stone, a hematite. And let's see what the spectrometer says. Right here you can see the spectrum we've just taken. And I will open up a reference spectrum I took off of iron. It was a pure iron sample. And we will compare the two. As you can see, there are clear similarities and they are clear lines these two spectra share. And that makes sense because hematite is mostly made out of iron and oxygen. This is a picture where you can see the similarities a little bit better. I made the experience that you get better results if you compare your unknown sample to reference spectra you've taken on your own system rather than comparing them to the lip spectra. I'm still working on getting most of the elements I want to analyze as a reference spectrum. For that I have to buy a pure sample, analyze it and save it in my reference spectra database. Here I'm analyzing a sample of silver oxide to test the function of the program to identify the element itself. If you have a pure element, this works pretty well. But if you have a sample that consists out of different materials, the software is a little bit overwhelmed in identifying the element. I will of course try to improve the system further. So if you have any suggestions how to do that, I would like to hear from you. And again, thanks to Gego for the awesome software and thanks to you for watching.